Hi, I'm Brett King and I'm very pleased to be coming to you from New York today to talk about the new Wing Bank. Of course, um, all of you will be uh, familiar with Wing as a mobile payments operator in, in the uh, region, but obviously this is a big move and I'm delighted to be able to speak on the future of banking and uh, some of the opportunities for banks like Wing and Wing specifically over the next few years. If we talk about the fintech market, it certainly has heated up in the last couple of years um, as a result of the pandemic. More people have had to rely on digital technologies like mobile phones for access to uh, basic services like food delivery and uh, um, uh, groceries has become very popular in the West and China. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of changes. Uh, children have been doing their schoolwork via Zoom on their phones and so forth. So this has been a, um, a big draw for investment in digital related services. So if we extrapolate where we are today and where we're moving to, we can see that there's an emerging ecosystem that includes fintech specialist companies, uh, it includes surviving banks, um, and it includes new tech, tech entrants in the market. Tech entrants really are the gatekeepers of the technology we use day to day. Companies like Apple, Samsung, Huawei, and so forth. You know, their uh, devices are what we're using to access banking and other services today. This is going to, inc we're going to show increased reliance on this technology layer as new technologies like smart glasses and intelligent smart speakers or personal AIs and other technologies like this emerge over the next few years. So this means that um, digitally native uh, customers will be using digitally native fintech and digitally native technologies in their day-to-day -day life. C really technologies designed from the ground up for digital consumers. But um, fintech has seen tremendous growth because of the change in behavior and more and more reliance on these uh, various technologies. So in uh, 2021, uh, the total fintech market, a uh, global addressable market in, in the, uh, around the world is about $7 trillion today. But we saw um, over $100 billion, about $140 billion worth of investment in fintechs. The third quarter, we saw the largest ever fintech quarter for venture capital and private equity investment in the fintech sector um, that we'd seen since we started talking about fintech back in 2008. So this uh, last year was a big year for fintech. In fact, in, in the third quarter, we did almost as much funding in the third quarter of last year as we did in the entire year in 2020. So the pandemic really didn't hurt these fintech companies. If anything, it's really buoyed the business model. When we look at some of the big names in fintech and the largest organizations in the space, challenger banks are often talked about as a specific class of fintechs. And they're particularly disruptive to the traditional banking sector. The largest fintech in the world today is an organization out of Shenzhen, China called WeBank. They were founded in 2014 by the same team behind Tencent and offered their first bank account in the latter part of 2015. So in just that space of a little over six years, WeBank has now become one of the top 20 banks in the Chinese market with 200 million customers. Their value today at about $70 billion in terms of their market cap, and they have some phenomenal technology. 98% of their customer service support inquiries are handled by artificial intelligence. Now, um, this is all fantastic, but the point is that banks like WeBank weren't possible before we had mobile technology like smartphones. And so we've seen a huge boon in these capabilities, bringing us new types of banking models. Another great example is the largest bank in the uh, Latin American market, based out of Brazil. 
This is a bank known as Nubank. You might have heard of them because Warren Buffett reportedly made a big investment into a new bank, over $100 million. In fact, they raised three quarters of a billion dollars, $750 million, just back in June of 2021. Now, around the start of 2021, we know they had 40 million customers. But when they IPO'd in December of uh, 2021 at a market cap of, of 50 billion dollars they had already grown to 48 million customers adding 20 percent to their customer base in just a single year their cost of acquisition is the lowest in the industry just five dollars uh, blended cost of acquisition per customer they have the lowest uh, credit card delinquency delinquency rate in the uh, in the latin american market amongst their contemporaries but more importantly than that, they have the largest market capitalization of any bank in the Latin American market. They are the biggest bank by value in Brazil and in the, Latin, the entire Latin American market. Why is that? Well, if we look at their biggest competitor, the number two bank in the market, it's Itaú Bank. Uh, now, Itaú is a 98-year-old bank. It's worth about $40 billion. And even though they have slightly more customers, about 55 million customers, they're certainly not growing at the rate that Nubank is growing at, nor can they acquire customers anywhere near the cost that Nubank acquires them for. In fact, Nubank, uh, last reported, pays over $120 US dollars per customer to acquire customers through their branch network. So even in the Brazilian market, that's very expensive cost of acquisition. Compared with Nubank, it's astronomical. That's one of the reasons the market is starting to value mobile banks like Wing and like Nubank, like WeBank, very differently from traditional banks. Much higher valuations and these traditional banks who have large branch networks and good ROE and all of those traditional metrics but they're just not scaling like these new emerging digital competitors. And that gives these competitors the opportunity to take market share in whichever market they enter. I trust this is the beginning of an incredible run for Wing Bank, given their mobile pedigree in the market of Cambodia. But it's not just uh, in Asia and in the Latin American market, we see the challenger banks having an effect all over the world. In the London market today, you have players like Monzo, Starling and Revolut. And um, today we see about 40% of salaries are direct deposited into these challenger banks. That's a significant um, uh, metric towards the changing market share dynamics of these new mobile banks versus traditional incumbent banks. So we see many different measures or indicators that these fintech challenges are really reframing the market. But it's more than just the challenger banks and it revolves around this core technology. The Chinese mobile wallet ecosystem is probably one of the, well, it is the top mobile wallet ecosystem in the world, but they've really revolutionized the way we think about payments with technology like QR codes, but more recently, um, their capabilities around facial recognition, which are extremely accurate. In fact, from a, uh, a fraud perspective, fraud on plastic credit cards is now about 10,000 times higher than that through mobile wallets, um, especially if you're looking at Alipay um, and organizations like that who are powering uh, the, these mobile banks around the world. Now, um, of course, in the United States where we are or in Europe, we don't have uh, the infrastructure for facial recognition and there's some pushback against that. But in reality, mobile bank accounts are already dominating the way we think about day-to-day -day banking. In fact, these the Chinese mobile wallet schemes we just talked about, Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay, did $52 trillion of payments just in 2020 alone. Now, um, that was in the pandemic. But keep in mind that this is 
almost twice the 35 trillion in, in um, global plastic card payments that occurred in the same period. So almost twice. That means mobile wallets just out of China without including Wings capabilities in Cambodia or um, you know, True in Thailand or M-Pesa in Kenya or Paytm in India or all of these different wallet plays, even before we start to include them, China alone did more mobile payments last year, considerably more than all of the world's plastic card payments. So we already know what the future of the bank account looks like. Your bank account in the future is not a passbook, it's not a checkbook, it's not a, a plastic card. The mobile bank account of the future is based on a mobile wallet or a cloud-based wallet that can bridge the gap between the digital worlds and the physical worlds. This is going to be core 21st century infrastructure. But the smart wallets we see emerging aren't like the dumb bank accounts of old with these plastic cards we just uh, tap without any feedback or, you know, the fact that we have to send a piece of paper, um, you know, to someone to send them money. No, these smart bank accounts are real time, but they start helping you think about your money in different ways. So you'll be able to ask your smart bank account, can you afford to go out for dinner? And you'll get the answer to that because of the use of artificial intelligence. You'll also have the ability to see your upcoming bills or predict your cash flow. So your wallet will say, hey, if you're going to make that trip over Christmas with your family, you need to reduce your spending over the next three months. Or, you know, if you've got school fees for your children coming up, Whatever it is, um, your wallet will be able to help you anticipate that and manage towards that. But the other element of this is the emergence of newer technologies we're going to be using instead of our smartphones over the next few years. We expect later this year or early next year for players like Apple and Facebook to announce their first smart glasses. Now these uh, coming into the market are going to be a new technology we wear, a computer we essentially wear on our face. And um, this will give us the ability to, um, sorry, just turn the volume down. This will give us the ability to see data in our field of view. So whether that's walking on the street or trying to find our car keys and asking our smart glasses where I put them and recognizing that they're on the table or going into a coffee shop and our, co and our smart glasses communicating with the point of sale there to make our order. This is the type of technology we're going to see emerging over the next couple of years. And with the smart glasses technology or spoken AI, uh, smart speakers, um, we are going to see a whole new level of financial advice appear in real time to help customers manage their money. But we've also got the emergence of the metaverse. So in these digital worlds, we'll be using uh, our digital wallets or digital bank accounts to cross between the physical and virtual worlds. This is going to result in a lot more embedded computer, embedded banking experiences. So um, instead of a credit card being required to make a purchase of, say, a new exercise bike, um, now that would be built into the purchase price with real-time credit access. We call this buy now, pay later today, but these sort of technologies they, um, are going to be built into the mobile wallet. In these virtual worlds in the metaverse, we'll have wallets, we'll be able to make money, uh, sort of like a TikToker or an Instagram, uh, Instagram influencer or a YouTuber might make today. People will create digital assets in these digital worlds and we'll need to use digital money and digital wallets to access them. So by 2025, things are going to look very different for banking than what we're used to. By 2025, you'll get more advice every day through your smartphone regarding banking and money than in an entire year you'd get from a human sitting in a bank branch or in a call center. And more than that, mobile bank accounts will be the primary bank account for the majority of people around the world. So more people will use a bank on their phone than have walked into a bank 
to get a traditional bank account. And that's the big difference we're talking about here. The fact that the leading financial institutions, the biggest player, use these technologies not only to reach their customers, but to indeed scale and grow. And the fastest growing financial services organizations in the world today are all digital first banks like Wing. And I'm very pleased to be a part of their kickoff ceremony today, announcing the new Wing Bank. And I wish them every success in becoming a major player in the Southeast Asian markets. Thank you very much.